Warning the following video contains real stories of organized crime. It contains graphic descriptions and mature language. The views and opinions expressed within do not necessarily represent the views and opinions held by Chronicles or its affiliates. Viewer discretion is advised. This Perplex TV episode, we will continue to profile Arizona Mexican Mafia member Jaime Sanchez. Prior to his release in October of 1992, the new Emmett was laying down a foundation inside the prison system. Coming off the infighting that led to the split, the carnales that the administration labeled the new Mexican Mafia were on a campaign to eradicate everyone that had been associated themselves with Jesse Bohorquez and established themselves as the only Emma in Arizona. Enemies of the Nueva were being hit on site throughout the Arizona prison system. In Kaibab unit of Winslow, Tomas TJ James was killed in the yard bathroom by Pablo Paul Eppinger, Robert Gray Harville, and Manuel Boss Hog Carrillo. TJ was found stabbed and with his head chopped off by a shovel. Manuel Indio Bojorquez and Armando Big Mondo Munoz, both MM members aligned with JB, were stabbed numerous times in separate attacks but survived. In Douglas, Carnal Mike Chino Garcia and Carlos Earthquake Alvarado killed old MM member Bandido. In South Unit, Albert Longo Carrion and Edward Tito Guerrero killed Sonny Moreno. Alonso Pepo Mata was stabbed numerous times and hit over the head with a barbell by Cedric Boxer Smith and Rudolph Troque Ramirez, but survived the attack. It soon got to the point that you could not go to any yard without being attacked if you were in any way associated with JB and those loyal to him. With the prison system fully under the control of those loyal to Eloy Slow, Slow Lerma, the Arizona M was ready to focus their attention on the street. Within this climate, Jaime was transferred down to a level four yard named Rining Unit in the Iman complex in Florence, Arizona. While being transferred there from the central unit, the walls, Jaime was placed in the transfer cages of the Florence complex where he met an individual he did not know by sight. He asked Jaime his name, and when he responded that his name was Jaime, he asked what unit he was coming from. When Jaime answered, he asked if his last name was Sanchez. Jaime answered that in fact that was his last name, and the guy responded that he had heard very good things about him, and introduced himself as Eloy. Jaime asked him if he was a carnada, and Eloy laughed and said, yeah, I'm something like that. Then Jaime asked him if he was Eloy Slow Lerma, and he responded that he was. Jaime says he felt kind of stupid with the way he asked that, but that he was somewhat starstruck. Eloy Slow Lerma was the leader or boss of the Arizona Emmy, and Jaime had heard so much about him that it caught him by surprise when he met him. So Slow asked Jaime what, what unit he was going to, and when he responds that he's headed to Rining Unit, Slow tells him that William Big Spider Lopez is over there, and to tell him that he was getting out and would be staying at his dad's house if they needed anything to reach him there. He then asked Jaime if he had been in the walls when they killed Gremlin, and when Jaime responded that he had been, he asked him to tell him what happened there, and after Jaime told him all he knew about that, Slow thanked him and wrote his address down for him and told him, since you're getting out soon, come see me when you get out. Hyman was then transferred to Rining Unit and did his last few months there. In October 1992, Hyman was released and picked up from prison by his mother and brother. That day, his family had a dinner for him where family and friends welcomed him home and gave him gifts. Late in the evening, he was visited by an old friend from prison, Eliseo Cheo Jimenez, who at the time was not yet a carnal but later did become one and a Mexican national paisa named Reina. Cheo had brought Reina to meet Jaime as he was the drug connection, and he had told Jaime in prison that he would introduce him when they were both out. Besides Slow, who had just been released, the only other carnal on the street was Marcos Code Red Dominguez. 
However, Slow died a month after being released from prison from a drug overdose. So together, Jaime, Cheo, and Code Red started laying down a foundation on the streets. Jaime got a job at a car dealership to keep his parole officer off his back, and up the street from the dealership was a high-end gentleman's club called The Highlighter, where Jaime frequently had lunch and would meet with Cheo and Code Red. They became friendly with all the girls and employees as they were also buying what they had to sell. Up until this point, the Arizona M had not set up a foundation. Most carnales were used to being the big dogs in a dog-eat-dog world. They were not used to having someone tell them what to do in a job environment. Most got out of prison and had nothing and had to commit crimes to maintain whatever lifestyle they were living and therefore were not usually on the streets long enough to set up any type of foundation for the M as a whole. This was the case when Jaime got out, except between the three of them, they had a good drug connection and were non-users, which was rare amongst most carnales. So around four months after Jaime was released, he's at the highlighter. Cheo had left to drop off a friend and would be right back. Jaime had ran out of cash, and so he walked up the street to the closest ATM. There happened to be a line of people at the ATM, And when it was his turn to use it, Jaime's card was not being accepted. He knew he had the money in the account, so he asked an older man that had kept telling him to hurry up if he could help him. The man rudely said, no, just hurry up. Jaime stepped out of the way and let the man go ahead. The man then, having used the ATM, made a final disrespectful comment towards Jaime, who then pointed his finger at the face of the man and told him that he better watch his mouth. The man got in his car and as he turned to drive away, Jaime had to jump out of the way because the man turned in a way that would have hit him if he had not. Jaime, becoming frustrated with the ATM, walked back to the club and as he entered the parking lot, he noticed a police car parked there, but thought nothing of it. As he continued towards the front door, the policeman then stopped him, patted him down and placed him in handcuffs saying he fit the description of an armed robbery suspect from the bank up the street. When they stand him up under the light in the parking lot and a cop car passes by, Jaime notices it's the man from the ATM. The man says, yes, that's the one who tried to rob me, and Jaime goes to jail. While in jail, he's able to get a bond. However, he will, he has to wait until he finishes his Department of Corrections time and they lift the parole hold. So while Jaime is in jail keeping in contact with Cheo and Code Red, some other carnales start to get released. Pete, Big Pete Celaya, Art, Smurf Cañas, Raymond Indo Llamas, Manuel Petty Martinez, and Benny Flora Hernandez. Inside the county jail with Jaime was Tony T.W. Watson, Ernest Dreamer Carranza, and Henry Big Hank Lugo. As soon as his parole hold was lifted, Cheo bonded out Jaime and picked him up in an old Chevy truck. When Jaime asked about the truck, since usually Cheo had a nice Cadillac, he told him that since he had been in, the task force had really ramped up the heat and so they had to be more discreet. Once out, they were able to start building a little foundation. Cheo had his connection Reina and Indio had his connections as well. The carnales inside the Pinta were being taken care of and everyone was doing good. Around this time, Jaime went to drop off a package to a carnal named Michael Chacho Camarena's sister, who at the time was with Randy Sleepy Bernal. Sleepy had asked Jaime to drop this package off, and as Jaime was pulling up in the car, he noticed Big Pete leaning into her like he was trying to kiss her. When he saw Jaime, he backed up into his truck and pretended to be there on another matter. Jaime acted as if he did not see what he had, dropped off the package and left. Three days later, Jaime gets a letter from Sleepy telling him to kill Big Pete for trying to mess with his girl. And as Jaime had seen that a few days prior and knew it to be true, he knew he had to do it. So that night, Jaime and Big Pete go out to a well-known Pinto bar, a bar where a lot of ex-cons go, named Sevillas. 
Afterward, they go up to 51st Avenue and Lower Buckeye, a place called the River Bottom, where Jaime shoots him multiple times in the chest. Pete ran away, getting to a convenience store and living that night, but told the police that it was Jaime who had shot him. So now Jaime is wanted for an attempted murder and is still on bond for the ag assault and attempt robbery. At this time, there was also three carnales out in Tucson. Terry Sapo Flores, Randy Lonely Boy Campos, and George Blade Sayer that were supposed to come down and report to the Carnales in Phoenix, but always seemed to have excuses as to why they could not make it. Jaime received word from the inside that Betty had been placed on the lista as well. A few days later, a missing persons report was filed on Betty. His girlfriend said he had left the house party in a white Cadillac with Jaime and Cheo and never came back. Police told Jaime's fiance that they wanted to question him concerning this disappearance of a documented member of the Mexican mafia. Until this day, Jaime's fiance was unaware of his involvement with this organization. One night, while driving, Jaime gets followed by a cop. He was headed to see Cheo, and as he pulled into the parking spot at Cheo's, the cop shines the light on the car and Jaime. In the passenger seat is a six-pack of bottled beer with one bottle open. The cop asks Jaime if he's been drinking and driving. Jaime says no, that he had just opened the beer when he pulled into the parking spot. So the cop tells Jaime to exit the car and notices that he has a police scanner. When he inquired about this, Jaime tells him he enjoyed listening to the fire department. Jaime had on a big Raiders jacket, and as the police officer patted him down, he felt the bulletproof vest Jaime had on, and the gun he had in his side holster. He cuffs Jaime, asking what all this was for. Jaime tells him for his own protection, but the cop calls in, asking if there had been any robberies in the area. Jaime had given the cop a fake name and social security number, both of a friend of his with no record, which he had memorized for just this occasion. The cops nevertheless took Jaime into custody, booking him in for a no seat belt and open container. They took a picture of Jaime with the vest on and two cops standing on either side of him, one holding up the scanner, the other holding the gun. After fingerprinting him and booking him under the false name, a judge gave him a bond and with the money in his pocket, Jaime bonded himself out. The next day, so his friend would not get in trouble since he had just used his name, Jaime had an attorney contact the cops and tell them who they had arrested and let go the night before. Needless to say, the cops were embarrassed and upset and so ramped up the manhunt for Jaime kicking in family members' doors and harassing friends and family on the regular. Sometime in early to mid-1993, Code Red called Jaime telling him that Sapo was in need. Later, Terry Sapo Flores came to Phoenix with 500 pounds of marijuana and two pounds of heroin. Jaime put him in one of the safe houses and would learn that Sapo had stole the drugs from a Mexican cartel that used his family's ranch in Nogales, Arizona to stash the dope. Sapo was strung out on heroin as well, and it was determined that he was a liability to the Emmy, and he disappeared as well. His family filed a missing persons report telling police they had last seen him when he and a guy named Jaime had come to deliver Christmas gifts and pick up a trailer. Sapo's truck was later found in Las Vegas, Nevada, Rumors were that his body was buried in the desert and has never been found. Jaime was finally arrested at his fiance's house, one of the times he had snuck in to stay the night. Early in the morning, concussion grenades were thrown through broken windows and he was caught. After some time in county jail, the attempted murder case was dropped due to Big Pete, the only witness, being killed on his front porch by recently released MM member Robert Gray Harville and Michael Joker Hawkins. And after his second hung jury for the armed robbery case, a bond was given to Jaime and he was once again bonded out by Cheo. That night in celebration, Jaime, Cheo, and Code Red went to Sevilla's bar. 
Sometime late in the evening, Code Red got into an argument with one of the bouncers from the bar over the bouncer's girlfriend hugging on Code Red, apparently purposely to get her boyfriend jealous. During the argument, Code Red grabbed the bouncer by the back of the neck, slamming his head on the pool table and putting his 9mm pistol to the back of the bouncer's head. But Jaime intervened, grabbing Code Red by the arm and walking him out of the bar, closely followed by Cheo and Cheo's brother who had went out with him that evening. As the four of them walked out the bar, the bouncer and his cousin, who was the bartender, followed them out, shooting them from behind. Jaime was hit in the back of his left arm and the left side of his face. Cheo and Code Red were both shot in the back. Code Red turned returning fire and hitting the bouncer before collapsing and dying there in the parking lot. Cheo and Jaime were able to get in the car and Cheo's brother drove them to the hospital being chased by the police. A few days later during Code Red's wake and funeral, Carnal Benny Floater Hernandez and Arturo Smurf Cañas tracked down the bouncer's girlfriend that had instigated the whole incident at a bar in Phoenix called Hot Shots and killed her and the bouncer's sister in retaliation for Code Red's murder. Later, two men were seen standing around Sevilla's bar prior to a grenade being thrown inside. During the owner, Thomas Sevilla's deposition in 1996, he said he believed it was the Emmet in retaliation for what had happened there and also stated that the employees that had been involved had moved to California after the girlfriend Laura and sister were killed. Tomas Sevilla ended up paying the MM monthly after that for the wrong his employees had done. By 1995, after the loss of Code Red, Cheo and Jaime continued to solidify the MS operation on the street. Jaime and Smurf bonded out Henry Big Hank Lugal on a $50,000 bond, putting up a house Smurf had. However, after getting strung out on heroin and missing his court date, Smurf lost the house. Big Hank, knowing he had to answer for this, attempted to hide in hotels. However, he was later found and killed by a recently released carnal named Chris Aslan Benitez. This is where we will once again pause. In our next episode, we will continue the profile on Jaime, getting into the death of now Carnal Eliseo Cheo Jimenez, and then the final months of Jaime's freedom that ultimately led to many years in the county jail and the favoritism and politics that led to his demise as a Mexican mafia member and a life sentence.